So as I mentioned, uh, I moved to doing a little bit more of an above country. So we started doing, looking at different countries, mostly in the Western Europe, again, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And the challenge we faced is we knew one thing. We had one thing that we knew for sure is that every country were moving in the same directions. We knew that in general the healthcare were moving to a more integrated manner. We knew that with the technology and everything and the information, new stakeholders were being part of the decision making. What we didn't know was at what pace each of these countries were going. And each of them were going at a very different pace. So basically the trend we knew, but then the pace of each country was hard to establish. And in countries where the physician was the sole decider and a very traditional structure, we needed to have traditional reps. We needed to see the one-on-one. -on -one. But in other countries, like for example, UK at that time, which again, physician had a list of product they could prescribe, which was limited. There was no product doing the same thing, and it was decided by higher instance. Again, we needed to have a very different role. We needed to have people with very different capabilities. And we needed to have non for those non-traditional customers to have more CAM and SAM. So what we developed then is a diagnostic tool to help us, I which I call the archetype tool. So basically, if you go from left to right, it's from archetype one to four. If you look at archetype one, these were the countries where really the decision was made by the physicians. So uh, where basically it was still a very fragmented uh, healthcare, and, and we didn't have the integration of other countries. So as you move through that archetype uh, model, if you look at archetype four, that was where UK was, was, was positioned, for example. Very integrated healthcare, decision making being outside of the, of, of the physician control. And then at that time, we needed, yes, maybe a few people or a few uh, traditional reps seeing our customers. A lot more flexibility in those, because again, it was depending on our portfolio. But we needed very different role. We needed role that were, had capability at the budget level, financial acumen, very different capability, very different role, and again, very different network to be seen. So that enabled us to do a few things. First of all, to position the country in the archetype that they were, to be able to um, align, despite I think that this week alignment is a word that's been challenged, but to try to have the same, the same direction because again, we knew everybody was moving in that direction. We knew that the, the pressure was to move out of archetype one and going in the other one, but each of them have their own space. But it also enabled the country to be more proactive. Because again, I can, I can tell you, we were very reactive when I was in Canada to move to the healthcare change. So that enabled us to position ourselves better to take that, 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 that route. So with that, we also looked at, again, helping the country and, and we, we look at developing a framework. Basically, the framework was providing information for each of the archetype on what kind of people do we need? And then providing some role profiles, some ideas. It was kind of, a, again, a toolbox. And structuring processes. As you evolve through those archetypes for each of them, what are the, the structure that you can use? What are kind of the, some of the processes that you need to evolve? What are the metrics and profitability you need to use? As you move in those different roles, those different archetypes, we needed to measure things very differently. How did we plan, do the, our customer planning was another one. We needed to evolve it and, and again, mimic it to the archetype that the country was in. What was the culture and leadership that was needed to be able to drive this? And that was closely linked with senior engagement. And also, what was the relationship, relationship management that we needed to do? So again, providing to each of the country um, a way to look at where they were positioned and a toolbox to help them to achieve two things. Again, as I mentioned in the pharma, we had the country leadership that was critical to engage. But that was also a great way to engage what I call the headquarter leadership and to really build the cultural shift that we needed to achieve. Strategic account management is not an initiative. It's not a project. It is a journey and it is a cultural, uh, a corporate culture shift. So that enabled us to do the same because at the headquarter level, they could have a view of where each of their country were and some of the things that they needed to do in order to be able to help the country achieve. 
don't know if there's any Europeans in this the room, and if this framework resonates with any of you, but basically, it looks like this. So, if any of you know this structure, this is called the Atomium. It's a structure that is in Brussels, Belgium, and, uh, and basically was built for the exhibit hall of 1958. It represents an iron atom, and it's blown up 160 million times. You can go in. It's a magnificent structure, and there's a magnificent view. Why am I saying you that? If ever you've been to Brussels, haven't seen it, it's worth seeing. If you plan to go, same thing. Um, I'm trying to position this as a better way of representing Brussels than their famous mannequin piss. <laughs> and because that's the time where I moved to Brussels to take over emerging market, and then try to global, for our 70 countries in emerging market, try to embark them and start the journey in moving to strategic account management. So as you can imagine, in emerging market, uh, the same challenges were, were, were faced. Very different countries. Um, if you look at account management in India versus what we had in Latin America or in Russia was very different. It was really hard to be able to do it for 70 countries. So we continue as a, as, a, as a global team to work on building the toolbox, I call. And we aligned on a vision. Corporately speaking, the senior executive, the headquarters were aligned on the same vision. What we aim to achieve. We also look at providing department strategy, how to help each department to be able to have a strategy that would also have in mind the customer and start with the customer in mind. And it was interesting because there was a lot of interest there. The internal department, I call them, were very happy to participate in creating value and having the customer in, in mind and, and going kind of outside in their mindset and, and starting with the customer in mind. So what we must do. Then we had the archetype that I showed you, the framework to help. And basically what it created is for every single country, um, every single of those 70 countries basically, a country roadmap. And that country roadmap enabled us two things. Again, to sustain the country leadership, to provide them with, again, what they, where they wanted to go, enable them also to pick and choose which step, because again, there's a lot of things that needs to be done to change that culture, and you need to go one step at a time. So it enabled them the flexibility to do that at their own pace with the structure, critical success factor, and a clear action plan. But at the same time, at the headquarter level, they had also a perfect view of what was going on in those countries, how the customer environment was changing, what was the plan to evolve to it, and how we could again become more proactive in, in going in the same direction at the same time. So, I'm, I'm a strong believer that, again, I know that sometimes we, we have too many processes, but a toolbox is critical to be able to communicate. It's a good communication tool to be able to sustain these initiatives. So again, in your own company, in your own industry, in your own area, think about what are the two, three things that you're missing in your toolbox. And if you don't have one, what are the things that would be valuable and help you? A lot of you are a strategic account manager, but again, how can you help bringing your corporation with you in that journey. So think about this. We needed also to look at change management. Again, the archetypes was one piece of it. The toolbox was another one. But we built what we call the customer-facing curriculum to be able to align on communication and, and provided some support in business process. What I mean by that is uh, in the pharma, we used to train our people a lot based on their role. So you had a training curriculum for reps, for CAM, for SAM. But at the same time, when I moved to emerging market, a SAM or a CAM in India or in Russia, although the same title, was doing totally different things. So it was really hard to be able to train them and provide this, the, the, the right level of support for them. So we built basically a customer-centric curriculum and really moved away from having role curriculum. It was based on Again, um, a, a blended approach, a modularized approach where each country could pick and choose what they needed depending on the role. And again, the basic one was aligning the whole corporation on the same communication skills, selling skills, and even the strategic account management were going through that, just to have the same way of interacting with our customers. 
But then as we, as we needed more specialized roles, we looked at negotiation uh, and many other content. And then for, for Sam, we had content like selling to the C-level executive um, and, and co-creation. So it was kind of a, a rep cam Sam, but instead of doing it like this, to allow the flexibility to the country and to get away from titles, we built it as a continuum. And then again, they could plan it ahead based on their archetype structure, and it was linked back to this. We also provided, again, a cycle to be able to ensure that each of them were doing customer insight and competitive insight, and to refresh. I think we've had many discussions this week about segmentation. How do you segment your account? So to refresh in a cyclic manner, to be able to respect the evolution of either our business or theirs, and redo the customer segmentation and targeting. Then to be able to realign or relook at our go-to-market strategy and renew our value proposition for them. And then finally look at the sales process. So do we see them with Sam? Do we see them with Cam? Can we afford to see them? And for the one that we knew that, again, based on that segmentation we couldn't afford to see, what are some of the channel strategy we can, we can use? Some of the multi-channel strategy, virtual reps, and all of those ideas started to, to emerge there. So basically what I've gone through is a little bit my journey and a little bit of the toolbox and, and the way we've used them to, uh, to maintain and support and, and be supported by our executive leader. If, I've, if we focus a little bit on executive leadership, um, I come from research. So I'd like to look at disabler and enabler using the analogy of virus and vaccine. In the area of our executive, when we need to bring them really to the account team. Because I do believe it's critical. To engage our senior leader, they need to be accountable for part of the account plan. So again, using the virus and vaccine, I've put down a few virus that we see in our executive. And first one I put down is arrogance. I think we all agree that to be at that level, you need to have a lot of self-confidence. It's, it, it, you know, like a, a career like that needs to have a lot of self-confidence. But there's also, let's be honest, arrogance that we feel, that we see, and, and more or less, but again, it's part of it. But when we bring our senior executive to our account and to our customers, they need to go back to their, what I call their humanity. They need to go, go back to their authenticity. And, and, and again, this is a very change in terms of behavior. We need to help our executive also change their behavior with our customers. It is a different thing. The second one I've put down is corporately self-focused. Again, our senior executives are there to drive our corporation. They, they have a lot of responsibility, of course, and they, they, they need to focus on it. That's their mandate. But then when they are becoming part of an account team, they need to bring insight. They need to be able to bring what has happened in the past. What are some of the key learning we've seen in our customers? What is going on right now? Is there any other customer I can connect you with? And, and also provide a little bit what, what, what they see in the future. They really need to become the connector. They need to be able to provide best practice. And to some extent, they need to be able also to connect customer together. Again, a very different behavior we're asking of them. And that's why I'm putting them as virus and vaccine to try to, sell, to help. The third one is listening to solve. Our executives are trained to listen to solve. Their whole career. When something is escalated to them, everybody's expecting them to find a solution or to help find a solution and to solve the issue. That's, that's, that's how they're, they're built. But then when you bring that same executive to our, to our customers, they need to listen to understand. It's a very different behavior, very different thing to do. And the more they listen, the more they're gonna understand the customer, the more they're gonna create that trust and that relationship. So we need to help them do this. The fourth one is connecting at a title level. I think we all do that. You connect CEOs with CEOs, VPs with VPs, and try to connect at the title level. But to really have a competitive edge with our customers, we need to, be, to start connecting at the relevance level. So a strategic account manager need to be able to understand their customer well enough 
to know wh where do they fit with their executive. Is there anything that they share in common? Anything in their career? Anything in their hobby? In their familial situation? To some extent, culturally speaking. And the more you can connect at the relevance level, the more you can accelerate the trust. Again, we all strive to do the same thing. The one that can really achieve this can gain a competitive edge. Last but not least is impatience. I think we all live in corporate impatience. And, um, and that's part of, of the day-to-day, -day, you know, like the speed, wanting to have resolve. Again, all of that being linked to impatience, as I've put it down. But when we bring our executive to our customers, they need to, to, to also start going in the customer phase, which can be very different. And they need to really respect that, which is, again, a different behavior. So our strategic account manager need to be able to, to help our executive do this, to be able to engage them in those, in those accounts. And again, they need to be accountable for some of the action. They need to have their share of that account team. That's the best way to sustain their engagement. So to illustrate some of them, um, let me tell you one story. I've, been, I've lived in Europe for five years. And it's funny how people ask me, why did I, live, why did I leave Canada? Like with the outdoors, the, the room we have, and the nature we have. And amazingly enough, Europeans, anyway, the one I've met, are fascinated by elks. By our elks. I've always had questions about the elks in Canada. And my answer to them is always, well, in Canada, you need to know that an elk is not an elk, and not necessarily. You have here, and I've put down the name, in English and French, because being French. So an elk or an elan in French that have their own, again, very, very um, uh, own characteristic physiognomy. They live in the prairies, as you can see, the woods are very different. But we also have another one in the same big family, which we call the moose, or in French, the orignal, where, as you can see, first of all, they're huge, their woods are bigger, their physiognomy is very different, and they live in the forest very different environment. And the last one, my favorite one, is the Wapiti, or what we call in French a caribou. And they live up north, all across Canada, but up north. And they have a very uh, recognizable white fur at, the, at, at their neck. And again, very different vicinity, different woods, different environment. So why am I telling you that story? Because all of them are elks. But again, not all executives are the same. And the reason why I wanted to make this point is because if you want to engage your senior executive, one thing you need to do is to open the channel for your son to be able to know the executive of your corporation as well as they know their customer. This is not an easy task, and, but that's something that's going to enable them to link them at the relevance. We need to open those channels and then break the hierarchy because our son to be successful need that. And I'm a strong believer that that's a key component of it. So another example. It's 8 a.m., so again, I want, to make, I want to have you awake, so I'm telling you a few stories. So another place where the senior executive are critical is what I call the barrier busters versus silo. And to achieve that, again, they need to be part of the account plan. They need to be very close to it. So let me tell you a story in very high level. Um, in animal health, basically, and if I take the species of the swine, like um, our representative, our CAM, are seeing veterinarian, farmers, distributor. That's the core of the customer we see. And the swine produce, production, one of the things that the producer don't want to have is what we call the boar taint. And the boar taint is caused by the uh, male hormone, the testosterone. And basically what it does is it creates an unwanted smell but also a lesser quality meat in the, bo in the pork. And to avoid this, boars are castrated. I will skip the detail, but I'm sure I got your attention here. <laughs> so at Zoetis, we have a chemical, we have a vaccine, which is a chemical castration. And again, if I focus on Europe, with all the animal welfare advo advocacy group that we have, it was very, very well perceived. So we were very optimistic when we launched this product to say, wow, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, a, a very good success. But we realized that although vets, farmers, 
an animal welfare organization, were very supportive. It didn't go. It was blocking. There was something that was stopping it from being successful. And we realized that, again, from the slaughterhouse to the retailer in Europe, we had protocols where they needed to be able to certify that the boars had been castrated. Again, manual castration, chemical castration, not to give any details, is a very different visual. So obviously, they were not able to, to do this. And, and it was a European protocol, and, and again, we needed to change it. So we needed to change the structure, we needed to change the way we were going, we needed to change also the, the customer we were seeing, seeing, and we needed also to be better at retailers. We had never done that. Retailers were a new area for us. So we needed to very quickly change and hire new capability, new people. If we hadn't had that senior level executive really closely involved, that agility in the organization would have never been possible and we would have never been able to be successful in this area.